So I wanted to share some personal news as well, which is the Good Clean Nutrition Podcast is going to have a new host. Yes, that's right. I am stepping down and I am passing the torch in order to pursue some professional opportunities. It has been an awesome experience and a real honor to help launch this award-winning show. And it's going to be awesome to have a new voice who's going to guide you listeners as you as you hear about the latest in clinical nutrition and sustainability and hot nutrition trends. Uh, so this will be my last show and the new host is going to be fabulous. And I definitely plan to keep listening and learning from the sidelines and remaining a fan of the show. One of my rules, Mary, is when there's just one sound bite about something. Like, remember how everyone's always said, like, it's fine for men to have two drinks and women to have one. Besides right. just the blatant sexism and patriarchy that that reeks of, since everyone, just, there's only one study that said that, and by the way, it's not true. Welcome to the Good Clean Nutrition Podcast. I'm your host, Mary Purdy, integrative dietitian and nutrition educator. Before we get started, we'd like to share a new feature that allows you to actively engage with the podcast. We'd like to invite you to submit your questions about episodes past or upcoming, to leave us a comment about how the show is relevant to you, or simply make a suggestion on how to make the show better. We do want to hear from you and simply visit healthcare.orgain.com slash podcast and record your voice message. We will review every submission and your questions, your suggestion, and your comment could be incorporated into an upcoming recording. Now let's get into this episode. Today, we're talking about the impact that nutrition has on our brain function and how improvements in diet can assist in improving overall mental health and managing mental health issues. So before I went to school for nutrition, I, uh, I think I thought that food went into your belly and was distributed to the rest of your body through your bloodstream. And it made sense that it might affect your heart and your liver and your kidney and things like that, because they were all just right there in that neighborhood. But I don't think I understood that nutrients could actually travel to and affect the brain. And in school and even at conferences I went to, we would hear about the blood brain barrier, which was this, you know, this thing that prevented anything from touching the brain. Nothing could get in there. But turns out that ain't the truth. And when I first started seeing patients, you know, they were coming in for energy or digestive issues or heart health issues. And I remember I had this patient who had high cholesterol and, and, and prediabetes and we were working with, with him. And as his blood issues, <laughs> blood issues, his clinical issues and symptoms became better as it related to his heart health and his diabetes or prediabetes, he actually mentioned to me, you know what? It's funny. I'm actually feeling better mood wise. I, I feel more clear headed. And I started thinking, gosh, there is definitely a connection between all of our organs and our brain. They are all talking to each other. So what is good for the body is almost always good for the brain. And today we are joined by Dr. Drew Ramsey, who I'm so excited to speak, speak with. Um, he is a nutritional psychiatrist, author, and organic farmer. Dr. Ramsey is a clear voice in the mental health conversation and one of psychiatry's leading proponents of using nutritional interventions. Thank you. He founded the Brain Food Clinic. His team offered the first nutritional psychiatry clinician training program, helping hundreds of mental health clinicians learn the evidence and clinical methods to effectively use nutrition. He has authored four books on food and mental health and is an assistant clinical professor of psychiatry at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons. Wow. Welcome, Dr. Ramsey. What a pleasure to have you on the show. Well, hi there, everyone. Hi, Mary. It's so nice to be with you all. Thanks for that kind introduction. Well, you are a nutritional psychiatrist, and I think sometimes we don't hear those two words together. So talk a little bit about how you as a psychiatrist became interested in nutrition as a way to help people manage mental health issues. We don't hear those words in the past because they weren't put together at all. And so I'm really mm -hmm. one of the first nutritional psychiatrists. There are a handful of us who've been interested in how do we incorporate food and nutrition into the clinical conversation in mental health settings. So nutritional psychiatry, as I've defined it, is the use of nutrition. And for me, that's really meant food, really to focus on food and the challenges mm -hmm. our patients have around food, getting it, preparing it, eating it, enjoying it, not having so much guilt about it. Yes. Um, so using food to optimize brain health, just as a concept, wh what would we do differently at each meal if that was our number one top priority? We're not thinking about weight. We're not thinking about heart health. We're not... 
Not that those aren't important, but we're just thinking about your brain cells. What would they want? Mm. Because they're your hungriest cells. And then the end of that definition is the use of nutrition to treat and prevent mental health disorders and concerns. And the idea behind that is really both of those are very powerful and somewhat different concepts. How we prevent mental health disorders in some ways is the holy grail of any medical specialty. Yes, uh, We'd love to put ourselves out of business because then people wouldn't suffer with mental health concerns. But then the mm -hmm. treatment piece has been so interesting, Mary, over the past really seven years, my ability to be in a Zoom room and talk with you with confidence and with significant evidence behind what we're saying. When, when you asked me about changing someone's diet later to help with mental health or depression, it's not a vague notion or a couple of patient stories. There are multiple five, six randomized controlled trials now showing that works. And yeah. so it's, so nutritional psychiatry is, is in some ways just being responsible with the evidence. We all know mm -hmm. nutrition matters for food. We all know we've neglected that. Um, and we all know that, that we, we, we can't do that anymore. We have a, a massive mental health epidemic on our hands. Certainly food is not the only part of the solution, but it, it's a part of it. And it's a part of the problem too. When you look mm. at, at what happens when we're eating, you get really sick and really, really struggle with your mental health. So talk us through how does food and nutrition, what's the molecular mechanism to bring us back to our graduate school days? Um, All right. Uh, of of how food actually affects the brain. So yeah, let's geek out a little bit for a while, Mary. So in Eat to Beat Depression and Anxiety, my most recent book, I, I get into the science and what I call like the new science of anxiety mm. and depression. And it's not just me, right? This is anybody in medicine. If you talk to anybody who's on the clinical side of mental health and really up to date, we're talking about inflammation. We're talking about the microbiome. We're talking about neuroplasticity, yeah. the ability mm. for the brain to grow and repair itself. And so often when I meet people, you know, they, they think, oh, I've got like Prozac. And it's kind of disappointing. It's like, it's the 90s, you know? Like I've done a lot since the 90s. We all have. So right. the, the idea molecularly of what's going on, I, I've got a video up on my YouTube channel, um, the nine mechanisms of nutritional psychiatry. And these are the ones kind of broadly that that I've identified with my, my collaborators and team is the kind of buckets by which it's working. And I'm not sure I'm going to remember all nine, but let's see. So, so one of the ways that, that food works is, and brain food works, is a fundamental principle is nutrient density. Yeah. So we're looking for whole natural foods that have more nutrients than your average food, right? The difference, for example, if you're looking at fruits in your fridge and there's pears and, and, and raspberries, you've just picked two that actually have a, a significantly uh, more fiber. Um, you know, you've picked fruits that are naturally a little bit more lower glycemic. Now, not that fruit in any way is a bad thing, but, you know, right. there's just, there's a way that um, if you are eating mussels tonight at home, you're picking per calorie, one of the foods that delivers more nutrition than anything else on the planet. And, and so uh, as we begin to shift towards that from processed food, let's take a patient, like one of my patients comes in, I, I treat a lot of, I treat men and women, I treat a lot of, probably like my favorite day is I'll treat some young guys in college, and then I'll get to talk to some moms in the like 50s mm -hmm. and 60s, probably like my, I mean, it's hard, I really love patients of all ages, but there's something about, I call them power moms, there's something about these, these uh, really um, thoughtful uh, um parents who are you know running usually a big family system and all of the challenges to them and all of the challenges to them around food and food and mental health but what we really try is like hey let's think how do we open up that burger experience for you to diversify and increase the amount of nutrients you're getting while still making it really delicious so mechanisms mm -hmm. more nutrients mechanisms mm -hmm. are decreasing inflammation right much of that is achieved through modification and thinking about the microbiome. Again, really complex science, pretty easy yeah. clinically. Besides all the nutrients and all the molecular geeky stuff, which is awesome, there's also just that very simple um, idea of community, food community, and mm. food culture that often gets yeah. missed. Right? It's mm -hmm. just as important to me that someone, you know, if you feel cultural resonance, with that burger and fries meal. That's what your dad grilled for you every time you went camping. There's nothing else I want to hear about you eating when you're camping, right? Because that's right. such a meaningful thing for you, your family, your father, right? And, and so understanding that cultural context. 
and they belong to a group. This is why we see like the vegans and the carnivores and the paleos and the brain foodies all saying similar things. Wow, essentially, wow, I got a somewhat restrictive diet cutting out most processed foods and I feel better. Mm -hmm. And then everyone loves to argue and debate whether it's like meat or the no meat or this. And it sort of seems so clear in the work that it's, it's, it's mostly about ultra processed foods and getting rid of those. Yeah, or at least minimizing them, as you said. I I love the 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 connection and cultural piece too. It is so key to recognize that when people feel connected to food, that connects them to their culture or to their family or to themselves. That in itself is a mental health benefit, right? So, um, and these mechanisms I'm hearing just to 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 clarify the nutrient density. And I wish we had a new phrase for that because I feel like people don't understand. They hear the word dense and they go, oh, that's wrong. But nutrient richness, right? This variety of nutrients. I like that one, nutrient richness. Yeah, like, I like it too. Thank you. I, 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 it was a little better. I agree. Yeah, yeah, density. You know, dense, who wants to be dense? dense you know? Who wants to be dense? Who wants to eat dense food, right? Unless, you know, you can't get a good piece of German bread or something. But this idea of reducing inflammation, um, activating the microbiome or supporting the microbiome with diet and food, neuroplasticity. And that's such an empowering term the the idea of being able to heal and repair and grow and the, you know these new neural pathways that can actually develop as a result of activity and food and i want to get into some of the specifics before we address specific mental health issues you talk about brain fitness which i think is such a fabulous term because we don't think of it like brain health brain function but brain fitness yeah what are some of the general tips for supporting brain fitness, food and well, uh, diet and lifestyle. Mental fitness mm. over the last maybe five years with our team. Thank you. Has evolved as the larger umbrella or that 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 nutritional psychiatry is under, or another way to put it is, is that it, it's one of the pillars of a foundation, mm. but it's not the only one. You can eat all the brain foods. If your sleep quality stinks, I'm, I'm not going to be able to do my job helping Amen. you get to your best mental health that you've ever had right if you're not thinking about your relationships and your connections and your emotional fluency and awareness i don't know like uh, that really handicaps my ability to do my job and help you because so much of what i do is is around that so Mm -hmm. um, but mental fitness is a new content. It started actually, we have the mental fitness kitchen, which is our free cooking class quarterly that we developed after the mm -hmm. healthy med trial came out. This was a trial. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had a lot of patients come in and, you know, they like these ideas and they're excited to talk about food, but then how you actualize it, how you do brain food for a busy family of four where both parents are working. How do you do it when you've got a limited budget or you're a graduate student? How do you do it when you're a medical right. student and uh, you've never eaten nuts before? This happened to be one of my favorite, uh, uh, I shouldn't say favorite patients. I love my patients so much, all of them. So it's really, but a, 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 a physician I worked with, uh, when I worked with since he was a medical student, had never eaten nuts because he tried them once when he was a kid and, and he said, they've tasted waxy to me and kind of like, mm. like rotten. And it's like, sound, sounds like you had a rancid nut. Right. And we tried them again. He said, no. I said, you ever eaten a cashew? He said, what's a cashew? And I, you know, and I, like Dr. Brain Food, right? I'm like, got all the brain food snacks in my office. And I said, well, you know, would, would you want to try cashew? And I was thinking like, is this okay in a psychotherapy office? I'm going to feed my patient. <laughs> this is a boundary <laughs> violation. And it was just, a, it was like this little simple moment. This guy was, you know, basically like, hey, I'm crashing in the afternoon. Hmm. I'm feeling uh, a lot of what I felt in medical school, just exposed, vulnerable. We call it getting pimped which is mm. such a phrase, but getting mm. pimped in medicine is when you go and, and and you're in this like, you know, big herd of doctors all in your white coats and they turn and say, so Dr. Ramsey, what are the five different types, uh, ways you can get um, hypoglycemia? What are the four solid tumors that live in the, and, and, and it's like, wow. and, and so you're, and so he, you know, I very much resonated with the anxiety he was having. Not that nuts are going to help, but he just noted, man, I'm just nibbling on candy. And I'm like, exactly. wait, and I'm getting kind of teased and I'm super anxious. And I'm like, well, what happens if you maybe nibble on some nuts? What mm -hmm. happens if, you know, in your lab coat, you've got a little uh, thing of, you know, cashews or almonds or walnuts. Let's try and unsalted and raw if possible. And it was really fun as a clinician the next month to hear about, you know, he was like kind of <laughs> like uh, pretty pleased with himself that he was eating nuts, yeah. off the candy. Um, so, so those kind of things. It's my hope that uh, people start having everyone 
has a mental fitness plan. You know, every week, uh, people look back on their week and they think about their physical fitness. Did they or didn't they? What they did? And we keep track more than ever with our trackers, how many steps, right? How many watts? I mean, everything seems like it's calculated. But my hope is that we radically transform our culture over the next mm. few years, in some ways, really, really inspired out of the necessity that we saw during the pandemic. And we yeah. become a culture of mental fitness. That's my hope here. I'm in this really wonderfully fit, uh, very mental health oriented community in Jackson, Wyoming. And, and part of coming here was, I think, wanting to be part of a tribe that is prioritizing mental fitness. That just like my uh, lunges and my burpees and my planks and whatever other things mm -hmm. that we're doing, I also just as important, just as high on the priority list, right? Right with that 150 minute exercise recommendation, I have a, a set of activities and time set aside to take care of my mental fitness, whether that's holding hands and going on a walk with my wife, or whether that's for me, I keep track in dinner how present mm -hmm. I am, I get a score of whether I'm at dinner, which is pretty good nice. for me. Like, like I'm mm -hmm. going to, you know, like I'm seven out of seven nights, mo most weeks. If, and, uh, and then how present I am. And I keep track on that really kind of, uh, I notice uh, really trying to look in people's eyes, my kids' eyes, keeping my phone away. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's shocking to me as a mental health professional who's really cared. It's about connection and all that stuff that even for me, <laughs> the phone's here, I'm <laughs> not sure I'll start reading the times in the middle of dinner. That's so yeah. horrible. And so really putting in, so, so mental fitness is about developing habits. It's about getting into routines and it's about prioritizing a care and nourishment of the self, brain, mm. food, sleep, movement. And then, and then for me as, as someone who's been primarily a psychotherapist, am I really kind of over the last 20 years, what, what I've really done and kind of spent most of my time doing is sitting with individual patients in 45 minute sessions I don't know how many of that I've done, probably 30,000 sessions at this point. And wow. so trying to, in my new uh, book that I'm working on now, uh, trying to take some of what we do in psychotherapy, just so personal and unique, and, and, and to create some frameworks for people to be thinking about their own mental fitness from an emotional awareness and emotional wellness standpoint. Um, and, and so trying to really, as we've done with nutritional psychiatry, promote this new framework. Stop thinking about calories unless you're thinking about nutrient density, right? Start yeah. thinking about inflammation. Start thinking about fermented foods in the microbiome. Start having hopefulness, like mm. neuroplasticity. With it. We have this, uh, at the center of that's this molecule called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Right. I call it the molecule of hope. Mm. And especially if you're like listening in your middle age, you know, man, you, you, you get a little like, oh, I do remember that name. Like, oh, I do know where my keys are. It's like, oh, I do have a summer <laughs> plan and I'm organized. <laughs> Indeed. It makes a big difference, right? You you feel that mental fitness uh, mm -hmm. when you invest in it. And and the BDNF, I I love that you mentioned that because that's something that I that I became really interested in. I know that 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 exercise activates the BDNF and things like green tea and omega-3 fatty acids. I want to talk about some specific foods that you feel like actually support brain health or support mental fitness like what are some of you, what are your top five foods or food groups that really um activate bdnf or support general mental health yeah so it, um i think about food and food categories with the idea mm -hmm. of trying to move away from a superfood movement i'm super guilty i was dr kale for years i ate a kale salad every day for years everywhere i went when i launched national kale day and yep. wrote 50 shades of kale I'm very excited about that. Like, for anybody listening who's like <laughs> thinking of writing a sexy book about a vegetable and you're in academic medicine, I, you should call me. Just like it's maybe it's maybe just something you want to talk through first. But okay. Uh, but my top foods, I think about I have my little rhyme: seafood, greens, nuts, and beans. And mm. and those represent the food categories that have the most of the nutrients that do things like activate BDNF. Uh, I would add in their fermented foods. And so when I think leafy greens, one, I think around like, how do people use those other than a salad? Because I think for so many Americans, leafy greens means they buy a chunk of romaine, uh, I'm sorry, a stock of romaine, or they buy like, a, you know, a, a box of mesclun and watch half of it rot. And so really mm. encouraging people to move beyond salads with leafy greens and, and braising greens, sauteing yes. greens. Uh, throwing greens in your soups and salads and sandwiches, seafood, 
I really like to encourage people to move beyond wild salmon. And and also, to, again, mm -hmm. as a nutritional psychiatrist, I don't want to just say, like, look, you should eat more anchovies. I want to say, like, hey, Mary, tell me about you and fish. Right, right. What, what was your household like growing up with fish? And, and if you lived, you know, on the coast, oh, boy, I'm really excited because I grew up in the Midwest. And so I love hearing those stories of, like, you know, the real fish eaters. Mm -hmm. um, where's fish now, right? Is it something you love and never cook at home? Is it something that you've never gotten a palate for? That really resonates with me. I didn't actually eat any seafood until I learned about the omega-3 fats. Mm. And I was a resident in Columbia. And I'm like, and, and I remember I felt so dumb. I had this realization like, you know, Manhattan's an island. There's a lot of seafood around here. I should learn to eat that probably. It was yeah. like this, mm -hmm. it was just this kind of like, I'd never really thought about New York as like a seafood town. Mm -hmm. And then over the next several years, I, I really learned to eat every type of seafood there was. But for seafood, thinking about the small fish, like anchovies and sardines, yes, um, and and how to do more than just like open up the tin and you know, like there are some people who do that, but most of us cook them in something or add them to a Caesar salad. Mm -hmm. um, thinking about the bivalves, mussels, clams, and oysters, particularly mussels, mm -hmm. they're such a uh, uh, one of my patients just yesterday, I was talking about mussels and I was like, oh, I love cooking mussels. Those are good for me. And I was like, yeah, mussels are probably pound for pound, buck for buck. One of the top things in the grocery store, they're alive. So, you know, check them, but they're, you know, before you steam them, they're alive. So there's fresh as it gets, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But they're incredibly nutrient dense for uh, omega-3 fats, iodine, selenium, iron, zinc, protein. I mean, just the list goes yeah. on and on of, of those top brain nutrients. And and the nutrient density is incredible. Like six oysters, shrimp, wild shrimp, again, nice entry seafood where people are like, oh, it doesn't have enough omega-3 fats. It's like, you're looking to diversify. So you end up in the sort of two to four seafood meals a week. And 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 so that means, you know, just if you just eat wild salmon for every one of those, or you're going to get bored. I do. Mm. Um, so expanding rainbow trout, probably my biggest culinary accomplishment is my son said a few months ago that his favorite food was rainbow trout I instantly started to cry of course but it just wow you know, notion of um diversity in the seafood um mm -hmm. uh, great I want to a side note here too is that seafood is incredible the, the bivalves that you talked about they are also incredibly sustainable so they're one of the foods that are being touted right now as being more sustainable fewer inputs less on uh, less impact on the environment so I love that you're highlighting those yeah, you know, and like anything, there are challenges. People are worried about microplastics in the ocean, you know, right. bivalves, the stomach, which is different mm -hmm. than a fillet of fish. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, there's uh, concerns as the waters are warming. We've seen these reports this year of uh, flesh eating bacteria in the warm waters um, and, and that contaminating oysters. So, you know, there, there's certainly, uh, uh, you know, both this wonderful opportunity and then, you know, from a lot of patients, sitting with them and going through those concerns, you know, I mean, I, I've definitely had food poisoning and, you know, it's, it's, it's mm -hmm. part of, you know, look at what's the top food category in terms of what causes food poisoning in America. It's leafy greens, the one I just recommended to everyone. And, and, and so, you know, there's the reality of being a modern eater and some of the challenges we all face of, you know, sort of sorting through the hysteria, the, the hysteria of some of the headlines Right. And then also right. understanding some of the truth that there is a lot of contamination in food and processed food. Let's finish up these food categories. Seafood, greens, pesto. I just got to say pesto. Mm -hmm. Just a great example of that's one of the main ways I eat my leafy greens. I grow like 20 basil plants. I mean, it's like the growing season here is like, that was it. So no one again. I mean, it's there used to be just 30 frost free days here. Now there's 60. So I have a little greenhouse, learning some greenhouse growing, but nice. I grow these massive basil plants and all these herbs. And I make this really kind of herbaceous, basically yummy pesto because mm. just such a great way to get lots and lots of greens. And again, we don't usually get, and it gives me another excuse to eat pasta. Um, <laughs> uh, seafood, greens, nuts. So all, all, I'm looking around my office, all around me usually are bags of nuts, cashews, almonds, walnuts. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I just think they're the ultimate snack. You look at an almond and it's like a little packet of olive oil because almost all the calories mm. are olive oil. Lots of vitamin E in almonds, one of the top sources. Right. Vitamin E, that fat soluble vitamin, so important for brain health. 95%, 96% of Americans do not meet the recommended daily allowance of vitamin E. 
Mm-hmm. So in all my books, like Eat Complete and, and Eat to Be Depression and Anxiety, I try to get into this idea of, of the only reason to know vitamin E is, to, is besides geeking out on PubMed, is to figure out which foods have the most of them. And that's what I was so shocked. Like, I didn't know. Mm. So that, that idea of really, for all of us as eaters, like, what's your top magnesium food? Yeah. Just, just think, oh, well, how much should I take at night? 400 milligrams? Is that too much? As opposed to how could we increase greens and beans and whole grains? Because that's where you find magnesium. Right. So those yeah. nuts and then beans facing such a gross, disturbing campaign of misinformation, beans mm. and lentils. Right. So yes. I would like to stand here in front of you all, sit here as a, uh, a voracious bean eater, bean soaker, bean lover, and bean prescriber. Thank you. Amen mm-hmm. to the beans. And, and then just a couple other in terms of top top foods. Um, oh, so hummus, black beans, red beans, those are always in our rotation in our family, really, especially for the kids. Big dose of fiber, it goes down really easy. Um, and then uh, adding more fermented foods is a food category that I've been thinking a lot about in terms of just my own diet. Of, of um, I stopped drinking alcohol and started drinking copious amounts of kombucha probably one of the bigger fights I've had with my spouse when she's like, are you going to keep drinking so much kombucha? And I was like, are you hmm. kidding me? I don't drink any alcohol and I'm getting like flack from my kombucha budget. But she was right. I was drinking too much kombucha. She was right, as usual. She was right. So, um, but fermented foods, at least as you know, Mary, with live bacteria, it was really interesting. Yeah. The bacteria we eat are not the ones that grow in the gut. I think it's always surprising to people. Uh, mm-hmm. It was surprising to me. And that the way that we shift the microbiome is not just by eating more plants. Plants are great. Most Americans certainly need to eat more, particularly those plants with more digestible, uh, fermentable fibers. Uh, that we call them the prebiotic foods. Oatmeal being a great recommendation or, or example. And then, the, but these live foods, foods you're going to find in the refrigerated section, sauerkraut, kimchi. Uh, it's sort of one of the most ancient processes in terms of humans and food. This is how we stored food as we fermented mm-hmm. it. Um, so, you know, everything from fish sauce to, uh, making sauerkraut at home, really fun thing to do with your kids. Don't forget to release the gas and don't be surprised. Cause it's really, it's a kind of shocking moment. Mary, you've made sauerkraut, you know, the moment where it goes from like, yeah, this smells like a cabbage fart yuck to like, I could totally try this. This smells kind of tangy and good. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so, uh, but fermented foods give us these live bacteria and just the data is really pouring in about yeah. how, how fermented foods actually modulate immunity. A lot of people are surprised. I was to learn that 70% of your immune cells in your immune system, really the center of your immune system is your gut. So when we're talking about all these like autoimmune disorders, when we're talking about all this inflammation, you know, it's one of those ways that food and, and mental health are just so clearly connected. Right. Because if some of mental health, we know that maybe 30 to 40% of patients who have chronic depression struggle with excess inflammation and and we all know that inflammation does not feel good right anybody who's had a virus or been sick recently you know that kind of biological bad sad not energetic mood you get it's just a it's a good example of inflammation's mood effects i'm mary purdy and you're listening to the good clean nutrition podcast we are on with dr drew ramsey discussing how nutrition impacts our brains so next, we will be diving into some specific ways to support mental health and mental illness uh, through diet. But first, uh, a word from our sponsor of the podcast, Orgain. Experience the nostalgic joy of childhood mornings with Orgain's fruity cereal protein powder. Indulge in the delightful taste of your favorite cereal without the guilt, as this protein pack blend offers 21 grams of organic plant-based protein per serving with zero grams of added sugar. Fuel your body and elevate your protein intake with good, clean, fruity fun. Learn more at Orgain.com. Now back to you, Mary. Now let's get back to our conversation with Dr. Ramsey. So Dr. Ramsey, I want to talk about some specifics because I would imagine as you, as you've mentioned up front, you know, we have been dealing with an epidemic of depression, of anxiety, of so many mental health issues. And I would be curious um, if you could give us 
maybe perhaps a protocol that you've worked with to help people specifically deal with a mental health issue. Maybe it's, you know, choose, choose your mental health issue that maybe perhaps you've worked with the most. Maybe it's anxiety. You mentioned, you know, eating for anxiety, eating for depression, um, or something perhaps more serious. What, what stands out to you as a way to really approach a very specific mental health issue um, with diet? So thanks Mary for the question. I think probably sticking with depression is, is, um, uh, most uh, appropriate because of the amount of evidence. So there have yeah. been multiple now clinical trials for the use of nutrition or food choice uh, in the augmentation of depression treatment. Uh, the first trial, 30%, 32% went to full remission just by adding on a Mediterranean style diet. Most recently, the AMEND trial, 36% of young men went into full remission of their depression simply by yeah. having two nutritional counseling sessions, uh, asking them to really, you know, stop eating so much processed food and start eating uh, plants that they like. Uh, so when I meet with an individual, I, I think that the, in terms of my protocol, uh, the, the first piece of the protocol is, is going to be assessment. And then I find so often people are jumping into ideas and notions and making recommendations or taking recommendations without proper assessment. They have an idea that might be going wrong, which is you know, a huge piece of the puzzle but sitting with someone and getting a sense, okay, is this depression? Is it a typical depression? Is it a postpartum depression? Mm -hmm. Is this a depression that's sort of existential in flavor? Both your parents passed recently and your teenagers are harassing you and you're really wondering about the meaning of life or it's a more biological depression. You don't, nothing's gone wrong. You just can't get out of bed and you want to kill yourself all the time. Mm. But life, everything in your life looks like there hasn't been a trauma or a tragedy. So that assessment of like, where is the mood concern coming from? And then the the, the individual kind of, I would say, um, feel of it. That, you know, when you look at clinical depression, there are nine different criteria. But someone who's irritable and not sleeping at all um, and feeling very hopeless and suicidal is very different than someone who's feeling lethargic. They're in bed all the time. They've gained 15 pounds and they just don't really have much motivation. And both, both people would meet criteria for clinical depression if they had a chronically low right. mood for more than two weeks. And so I think that assessment piece is my first step. Mm -hmm. um, then as a, as a psychiatrist and a, a physician, you know, I think sometimes people are surprised that some, sometimes uh, initial steps for me include medications. And, and in part, that's just, it's because they're very helpful and effective for a lot of patients. When we look at how medicines work, they work in some ways uh, by dampening down some of the connections. So if you're very activated, you're stuck stuck in a kind of really depressive thought loop, you're having a lot of really you know, uh, very dark thoughts. So that, that um, so making sure that I'm not uh, in any way having my patients suffer longer than they need to. Um, both food and medications take, you know, three to six weeks to work. Um, mm -hmm. So... Uh, but in terms of and sometimes those medications, like they, they help people get to the baseline that they need to get to so that eating fermented foods or even eating foods that support their brain, even if it is a viable option, right? So it can kind right. of give people that, that it's base. such a good point. It's like when I meet people and they like, for what, they don't like therapy, they don't like meds, they don't like psychiatrists, but they can get along with me well enough and they just want to talk about food. Some people are really uncomfortable with that. I love that because I think, mm. you know what, it's like a pretty clear job of what you want and if you are ever going to try Zoloft, it's probably going to be with me because I'm going to sit with you and do everything I can with the food to help make that work and, and to be in a right. space where it's not doing enough. We can, we can be honest about that and think about other options. And I don't want to say like, it's not like food and Zoloft are the only two options we have. In terms of my protocol for food, I do an assessment we teach in our clinical training program, uh, a, a simple food assessment where I really like to walk through someone's day as an eater. You wake up, how are you feeling? What are your thoughts and feelings and associations about food? What do you eat for breakfast? What do you eat for lunch? What do you eat for dinner? What I find in general clinically is people, clinicians are often um, uh, a little bit superficial in their history taking. A good example, let me break up my nose, a patient I just saw yesterday, and, I, and, we, and we hadn't done a lot of food work. I've been working with him on some other really kind of huge issues, but he's really interested in food. And, he said, and I said, you know, let's go through breakfast. And he said, you know, I usually skip breakfast. I said, okay. Yeah. He said, when I eat it, you know, it's like oatmeal with some berries and some peanut butter. So you could stop there, right? But there's some things missing. 
right? He's a guy in his 20s. Coffee or no? If no coffee, tea or no? And it's so like, how'd that happen? Because most people, you know, are having a coffee in the morning, right? So you begin to learn something about him, right? But then there's that question, what else? And he said, oh, well, uh, there are a few other breakfasts. I said, oh, what about eggs? He's the one who said, you know, oh, yeah, no, no, a big breakfast for me. I get a couple of eggs. I scramble. And I said, what about, you know, smoothies? I said, oh, no smoothies. How about yogurt? No yogurt. So I kind of go through, there are really only five or six breakfasts that people eat. And I just kind of check to really try and be thorough. So if you ask me in a broad, kind of broad brush way to paint someone's dietary pattern, I could. Mm -hmm. And if you ask me to say, oh, a typical Wednesday for, you know, Tom looks like what dietarily, I, I could tell you. And when he goes to the grocery store, what happens? I could tell you. So getting in a little deeper is for all the clinicians listening, which, you know, all good, good clinicians know. But I think when we get rushed, right, or when we don't kind of consider the work sacred in a certain way and, and really kind of get into the depth of it, we can forget that. Um, we go through breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I go through snacks. I always like to know everyone's favorite food and favorite meal. Yes, like, me too. I like to know foods that people feel guilty about. Mm -hmm. I like to hear people's like goals right now. Like what are some things right now that strike you as really important? Um, in doing this, I'm kind of watching the conversation with that like clinical third eye, you know, and I'm paying right. attention to the food categories in nutritional psychiatry and what's missing. So if I hear about, and I'll sort of have it in front of me and I, and I look at most of the meals people eat and I don't see a lot of plants. I'll say, hey, tell me a little bit more about you and plants. Right? Or if I don't see any seafood, I'll say, hey, I don't see any seafood here. Tell me about you and seafood. Where I want to hear both the narrative story of the person as an eater. I want to hear what they like and they don't like. And I want to get a context. Are you a sushi eater? Like, no, no seafood. Oh, what about fish taco? Oh, you like fish tacos. Okay. And so they're just, we're kind of, both brainstorming, but creating framework about where the change can happen and where kind of what's next um, right. like the with the nuts. He didn't come in with nutritional goals, but he didn't like eating so much candy. He thought it was a bad look in front of his attending doctors. And so, you know, that's where, as you said, it was a kind of simple intervention. I think there's also just the, it's easy to make a change for a day or two. It, it takes a little bit to get into a good habit. Um, and so Absolutely. I also really encourage clinicians just to be focused on those little steps, like little goals. Usually I meet with most patients weekly. And so it's just kind of once a month or so, I like to bring up food and see if there's a little something we're working on or a little progress that they've made or a question that they have. Um, I would that, imagine that your suggestions are so much more well received because you've taken the time to get to know that person, to understand what their daily habits are, their likes, their dislikes, and what would make it easy for them to incorporate these foods. So you're not saying like, oh, you should have quinoa when they've never even heard of quinoa. It's more like, oh, let's just add some leafy greens to that sandwich that you're eating every single day or whatever the case may be. So that speaks a lot. Well, thank you. I mean, I, I, I hope people feel uh, known in that way that we try to know people in mental health and psychiatry. And, and also, I think sometimes we also need to have the humility that, you know, sometimes we have ideas that patients don't like, uh, or that don't work, or that don't stick, or that people are struggling in with change for other reasons. And so I think the other in terms of, you know, kind of my protocol, besides focusing on food and food categories after careful assessment, in the book, I go over a six-week plan, which really is a notion of not doing it all at once, right? Let's focus on leafy greens and just kind of get more of those in for a week. Let's focus on seafood. Try and get that in a couple of times this week. You know, next week, let's focus on nuts, beans, and seeds. You know, you got a bunch yes. of old stale stuff in your fridge. And right, next week, let's focus on fermented foods, just so there's, you know, a little bit of an agenda each week in terms of a goal for yourself. And for everyone listening, that's a little bit what I recommend for you as an eater, too, you know, not the, the goals really need to move from what most people call calories and quantity and really start focusing on specific foods like arugula or lentils or, you know, um, if, if, you know, if, if, what's your butternut squat soup game like or tin fish game? I talk a lot. How's your tin fish game? Mm -hmm. You just got that same old tin of anchovies sitting in the back of your cupboard that have been there since like 2017. Like, Okay get rid of those probably. And like, let, let's like, how could you commit to and accomplish um, uh, an exploration of that food? It's, it's one of the other ways you asked me mechanisms that we didn't mention that I love. It's a mechanism of empowerment. 
This nice. thing is for your mental health. Let's talk uh -huh. about how it's in your life. Now you've got a little goal. Now you've eaten anchovies. Is everything great with your mental health? No, that's obviously not. It's not that simple. But that loop of like setting and achieving goals and, and, and doing something that for sure in the science is good for your mental health and your brain health. Yeah, I think that's that that's really a critical part because when you're depressed or anxious struggling with your mental health you know one of the worst parts is when you find yourself not doing as much as you need to about that I have a patient right, right now that's just not getting out of bed and you know when I finally get to talk with her usually later in the day she's just so remorseful and so the the, the even little things get up have a smoothie get up, mm -hmm. you know, just mm -hmm. have a cup of tea and get out. You can go back to bed if you need to, but at least get out and walk out, get some low lateral light in your eyes, you know? You yeah. Know, those, fresh, fresh those, small, those small steps, they really, they really do add up. Um, I have one final question for you as we, as we wrap up here, because I, I imagine people want to know you, you are a food first uh, physician, as you, as you said up front. I also know that people have looked to supplements as something that might help to again, supplement the process or add in some of those nutrients. And some things even like, you know, th that we hear about sometimes, like what about turmeric? What about L-theanine? What about taking GABA or St. John's wort? Which of these, if any, do you commonly work with and have they worked? Yeah, well, I think there's, there's a little, you know, these have been studied extensively. And so I think that the challenge with some of what you mentioned is the difference between the clinical data and the public opinion. Right. Turmeric is a good example. And even a lot of experts still recommend turmeric. You know, lots of people talk about turmeric helping their joints. And so it's hard to hear that and, and not feel, you know, excited for them. Like it's great you're in less pain. I think the challenge is, and one of the challenges with clinical evidence is when you do a randomized trial of turmeric, there, there isn't really much of anything that happens. And even if, you know, as everyone loves to say, eat your turmeric with black pepper. One of my rules, Mary, is when there's just one sound bite about something, like remember how everyone's always said, like, it's fine for men to have two drinks and women to have one. Besides right. just the blatant sexism and patriarchy that that reeks of, since everyone, just, there's only one study that said that, and by the way, it's not true, right? The most recent research says that no amount of alcohol consumption is beneficial for your health, period, right? Mm. Minor amounts of alcohol consumption change your brain structure and brain matter, period. Again, not to be fear mongering, but just so we think about something like turmeric, the uh, Society of Medicinal Chemists came out several years ago and issued a paper that essentially said, folks, there have been 1000 randomized trials of turmeric for human health and zero of them have shown efficacy. What are you all thinking? Why are you spending millions of dollars on turmeric? It's an amazing spice. Eating it is probably helpful. Right. And then what I find interesting is there's always like the couching. Well, maybe it's great for the microbiome. Maybe it does this, maybe. And look, maybe it does. Right? I, I, I certainly don't know. But I think there are some supplements like that where there's not data. There's some supplements where there's a lot of data and it's not particularly good. Omega-3 fats are the best example of that. Mm -hmm. People, mm -hmm. especially people who eat seafood, it's not really clear that taking omega-3 fats is helpful. In, in the meta-analysis of the trials for depression, you see one point of improvement on a clinical scale. And so it's statistically significant, but it's not clinically significant. I mean, and, and so do I have patients take fish oil sometimes? Sure. If someone has a chronic mood disorder and they don't eat any seafood and they don't want to, but they're willing to take a fish oil supplement, that's a great way to get omega-3 fats into that person. If there's a right. vegan or vegetarian that I'm working with and they have a mood disorder, I'm going to wonder about fish oil, or if they don't want to eat fish, I'm going to wonder about an algal oil. Again, mm -hmm. just as something to kind of add in. Other supplements I've been mostly more concerned about, um, some of the ones you mentioned certainly have data. St. John's wort is probably the one that I've used the most to treat clinical depression. Um, mm -hmm. It's one of the most popular antidepressants prescribed in Europe and in Germany in particular. It's the top antidepressant for adolescents, uh, last time I checked. Um, that might not be true anymore, but uh, it... it, it has been sort of challenged. There have been a couple of trials that have not shown efficacy. That's kind of similar. You know, you can say the same thing about SSRI antidepressants. There's a mix of data, but St. John's work is one of those, again, has reasonable data behind it and unclear exactly how it works. Actually, there's a big shift in the mechanism 
Uh, for a while, people thought it worked like an MAOI inhibitor, but it doesn't. Uh, it seems to work as a kind of anti-inflammatory in the central part of the brain, maybe, uh, mm -hmm. or as a stress modulator. Um, I think things like supplemental magnesium is another one that I sort of see in my practice as patients really struggling with mood disorders and anxiety, uh, struggle with sleep, and and you know magnesium tend, tends to promote kind of more calm and more sleep. Well, actually, the very, very first clinical trial ever for depression was like in the early 1900s, and it was of IV magnesium for agitated depression. And it's one of these like very old medical trials, but like the reports were like, you know, uh, essentially a after an hour, like everyone was calm or asleep and, you know, mm. and, who knows, right. But just in, in, as we think about that nutrient, um, uh, again, I, I mostly focus on how do we get people to eat more of it? Um, some of the other supplements that I just think are of interest, a lot of people take B vitamin, B vitamin complexes, right. Uh, you know, I, I think that mostly this is making expensive urine, you know, your body. And I also, I guess one of, you know, one of my other concerns about supplements is just, you know, sometimes people, you know, are very vigilant about like the foods they put in their mouth. Um, but there's not sometimes a consideration that your body has to deal with the supplements you put in your mouth and that it, 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 it's actually kind of hard. I mean, you've never done it, neither have I, but to like get handed a set of, you know, 40 different molecules, which have to be handled, processed, transported, modified, and excreted from the body. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's, that's like sort of, that's pretty complicated to do for a biological organism. And so um, again, for people who are struggling with nutrition, you're traveling and you can't find good food or you're in a food desert or your kids are struggling with their mental health and for whatever reasons, budget, time, expertise, access, you just really don't feel like you're getting there nutritionally. Now that, that's where I think there's some appropriate use of supplements. Um, I think especially for parents, sometimes it just feels good, you know, and I think it actually kind of shows how much we've abdicated our sense of, of health and wellness to the industry, so to speak, the idea that I feel more relieved when my kids take a fish oil pill and a multivitamin than I do when they eat wild salmon or a little more, maybe not relieved, but a little bit more like sure they got it. Um, you know, I just think right. it, it speaks to the kind of supplement and pill culture that we have. That's a great point. And, and this, this idea of, of somehow validating the pill over the food and how that's been pre presented to us culturally and from a societal perspective is very right. interesting. Omega-3 fats our medicine, but sardines right. that come in a little pill. Are, yeah. Yeah. Our food. Mm. And, 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 you know, even though if you were going to supplement somebody or augment their diet with omega-3 fats, doing it with sardines would be, you know, there's no clinical trial of that, but it, it would just be so much better for the individual's health. Yeah. So seafood, beans, greens, nutrient richness, empowerment, reducing inflammation, uh, connection, community, culture, all of this um, have been some of the highlights of our talk today. And I know that listeners will be interested in knowing how they can find you and learn a little bit about uh, the clinic or the brain food score, or your, your books. What, what would you like to share it in, uh, in, in, your, in your final moments here with us? Well, thanks. First, I want to thank everybody for listening. And I just want you to use this conversation for you. And that I hope something, whether it's lentils, whether it's a silly dad joke I made, or whether it's one of those tangents that Mary pulled me back from, that it that sticks in your mind a little bit. I know it's a lot to ask. And it helps you just make that little bit, just that little bit better choice for your mental fitness and your mental health. As I always say, you know, uh, I want us all to work on building our mental health and mental fitness. And then when you've got it, to, to work on passing some of it on. Uh, I'm easy to find. I'm Drew Ramsey, MD. I'm on Instagram. That's my website. Um, we have the Brain Food Clinic, which is our digital mental health service. We've actually also started a new integrative psychedelic medicine clinic in Jackson, Wyoming, um, Spruce Mental Health. So uh, we're really excited about that. Well, thank you so much. Feed your mental health. Thank you, Dr. Ramsey. Um, it's it, it's been great hearing all of these different ways and approaches to 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 mental fitness. And I'm sure our listeners are feeling a little bit more mentally fit after this episode. So thank you so much for the work that you're doing with bringing in nutrition and food as a way to bring uh, medicine or vitality to our brains. 
Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Good Clean Nutrition Podcast. If you like this podcast, we would really appreciate it if you would give it a five-star rating or a review on your favorite podcast platform like Apple Podcasts or Spotify or a thumbs up on YouTube if you're watching right now. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, if you want to submit a voice message with a question or a comment about today's episode with uh, Dr. Ramsey, visit healthcare.orgain.com slash podcast to record your message. And to stay up to date on the latest episodes of the podcast, be sure to subscribe.